Okay, so yesterday we were talking about the uh, about systems and we talked about the laws of thermodynamics. So just quick review here. Okay, there were three kinds of systems that we went over yesterday. What do we call a system that will exchange matter and energy with its surroundings? That's an open system, right? Okay, if it exchanges neither one, then it is isolated, okay? And then if it can exchange only energy but not matter, it is closed, okay? So those are our three kinds of systems. Um, and then we talked about the laws of thermodynamics, all right? The first law of thermodynamics talks about how um, energy can't be created or destroyed, how you can add energy to a system, okay? How energy can be lost from a system, okay? Um, and it talked about how that could be done with work if it was mechanical energy. So a system does work, it will transfer mechanical energy away okay, to something else. If it has work done on it, it'll gain mechanical energy. Similarly, if heat is transferred to a system, then its thermal energy will increase. If heat is transferred away from a system, its thermal energy will decrease. Right? So those are all the ways that energy can change, okay? but we have to remember it can't be created or destroyed. It can be converted, it can be transferred, but it's never truly gone. Right? That's what we have to remember about the first law of thermodynamics. We ended off talking about the second law of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics talks about the direction that energy flows. Okay? Thermal energy always flows from a high thermal energy object, hot, to a low thermal energy object, cold. Okay? Uh, so it's always going to flow from hot to cold. And we said that if you had a really hot area and a really cold area, and you had some sort of machine in the middle, the flow of energy from hot to cold could flow through the machine and do useful work. Okay? And we called that a heat engine, and that's what we ended off with yesterday, was talking about how a heat engine works and how a jet engine is an example of a heat engine. All right? So they had this simple diagram of what a heat engine theoretically looks like. Okay? So if this is the jet engine, okay, then this is the area here where the fuel is burned, okay? A jet engine burns JP5 fuel, which is essentially kerosene, okay? If you ever have seen like uh, older camp stoves that you have to pump, okay? They use white gas or kerosene in them, okay? And they burn really, really hot. Kerosene releases a lot of energy, okay, per like gram of, of fuel, right? So they burn that, it creates a lot of heat, okay? When that heat is trying to escape, you got to remember, a jet is usually moving, right? And so the air is forced, along with the heat, through the turbines, okay? And so the jet engine part would be right here, okay? A lot of the heat would just go right through the jet engine and out the back, right? But some of it turns the turbines, which creates additional work or thrust, okay, from the engine, and that's what propels the plane forwards, okay? Everybody with me on that? Right. If you've ever watched like certain like action movies and things like that, they'll they'll talk about how uh, or they'll show that somebody can get like sucked through okay, a jet engine. Actually true. Okay, you could actually be sucked into a jet engine because there is so much flow of air okay, from front to back. Right? It's what happened uh, with the miracle on the Hudson. Okay? Birds got sucked into the engines, okay, and as they went through the engines, they destroyed the little turbine blades that create thrust, okay, which is why they couldn't uh, gain altitude and had to land on the river. Right? So these jet engines work that way, and there's so much heat generated that it pulls air through, okay, creating the thrust that propels the jet. Okay? Everyone kind of follow on how that works? Okay, but it's all caused by this temperature or energy differential. Okay. The bigger that energy differential, the more thrust you can produce. Okay, so that's how a heat engine works. Okay, now a heat pump still works on the idea of the second law of thermodynamics, except it wants to make it go backwards. So it's not really breaking the second law of thermodynamics, but it's finding a way around it. It's bribing an official, if you will. Okay, it's going to use energy to make heat go from a uh, cold area to a hot area, okay? Because it doesn't naturally want to do that. The second law of thermodynamics is energy for, should flow from hot to cold, but a heat pump will actually pump the heat from the colder area into the warmer area. And I said yesterday that you can feel that under your fridge, 
Okay, when your fridge is running, you can feel warm air coming out from underneath or from the sides, depending on how your fridge vents the air, okay, uh, from the fridge. Okay, and what it's doing is it's using a coolant that circulates through the walls in the back of the fridge, okay, um, to absorb energy from the food and then release it into the room. That takes energy because we have to circulate it. Okay, we have to circulate it and vent that heat somewhere else, somewhere where it shouldn't naturally go. Okay, so uh, a refrigerator and an air conditioner both work that way, but you have to be able to pump that, that heat somewhere else. If you don't, you're always pumping it back in and then it won't work. All right, so if you have an air conditioner at home, it takes the air, the heat from inside your house and pumps it outside. Okay, where it's already hotter, but it doesn't try to mix that air back in. Same with your fridge. Your fridge is sealed airtight, okay, and so the heat isn't going back into it. It's being blown out into the volume of air that is the rest of your house. Right? Homer, Homer Simpson learned this the hard way. Okay? He tried to use his fridge as an air conditioner. Why doesn't that work? To use your fridge as an air conditioner, you have to do what with the door? Yeah, and leave it open. So your fridge is trying to cool a much greater volume of air than it's supposed to. Instead of just the volume inside the fridge, it's now trying to cool all the air in your entire house. Now, Homer wasn't that stupid. He built a tent over his fridge. Okay, And, he, and essentially then, he, he thought I would get cold inside this, this tent. The problem is that the tent also enclosed the area where the fridge was trying to pump all the heat to. So it just kept running. And eventually, what does it do to the fridge? It just burns it out, okay? So I'm gonna show you the little video here I found. So as we can see in that video, okay, he burns out the fridge because the tent is over the area that the pump is trying to pump all the hot air to. So it just keeps pumping it into the area it's trying to keep cold and the compressor just continues to run until it burns out, right? Uh, so lesson to be learned here, don't leave the refrigerator door open. Okay. It's not designed to ventilate or cool that much air. Okay, uh, so heat engines, very simple heat engines, like we said, are just going to harness the flow of energy from hot to cold. In fact, if you have a type of thermocouple attached to an electric motor, you can turn a fan if you have one side of the thermocouple in hot water and one side of the thermocouple in cold water. Okay, the fan will continue to run until the temperature of the water is the same. It'll go slower and slower and slower as the temperature differential changes, okay? But um, at least at first, it would run, okay? Um, all right, now for a heat pump, okay? The way your refrigerator works is that you've got a compressor. That's the thing you can hear running when the fridge is running. That's the compressor, okay? Um, the compressor takes the coolant that runs throughout the fridge. So there's little um, coils that run in the walls and in the top of the thing, in the back of it, okay? And those coils are all filled with coolant. The coolant is designed so that it will change state from liquid to gas around the temperature that you keep your refrigerator, okay? So when it changes from liquid to gas, it can absorb a great deal of energy. And it absorbs that from the volume of air and the food inside your fridge. So it changes to a gas and then is pumped to the compressor. The compressor forces that vapor now, okay, the, the um, gaseous coolant, back into a liquid form. And when it does that, it releases heat. Okay, all the heat that it absorbed to become a gas is then released back as it's forced back into a liquid state. Right? That's what the fan is ventilating out the bottom of the fridge, and that's the heat that you feel. It's the heat that was absorbed by the coolant and then released by the compressor okay, into the volume of air in your house. Air conditioner works the same way, it's just much bigger, right? So an air conditioner has way more coils, okay, and works over a much larger volume. Okay, so a refrigerator pumps heat from outside or from inside the cooler interior space to a warmer outside space, okay? This process is not natural, so work has to be done by the refrigerator. A heat pump uses energy, and in fact, it uses a lot of energy, okay? Your refrigerator is probably the largest single um, electrical appliance in your house in terms of the amount of electricity that it uses. Now, when your oven is on, if you have an electric oven or an electric stove, that'll use a lot, but you don't use it as much as your fridge. Your fridge is always on, okay? Your oven or stove is not. 
Okay. Um, but your refrigerator uses a lot. If you have an air conditioner, your power bill goes way up in the summer because your air conditioner uses a lot of energy to do its job. Okay. To break or to go around the second law of thermodynamics takes a lot of work. Okay. So it uses an electric, it uses electric energy to pump the refrigerant through the copper piping and then um, like we said, it, it changes its state. Okay, so thermal energy is transferred to the air surrounding the refrigerator, and the refrigerant is then pumped into a condenser where it's cooled and liquefied, and then the cycle repeats. Okay, so that's how either a refrigerator or an air conditioner works. Okay? Um, obviously, now we have much better um, refrigerants. Okay, we used to have a really good refrigerant that we used in everything, but we found out it was really bad for the ozone layer. Okay, it was called Freon. Okay, and Freon worked awesome. Like. If you ever find an old fridge that still works from like before 1980, it'll get stuff super cold. Okay, um, but Freon is very bad, so we've replaced all of those coolants with okay uh, non CFC refrigerants. Okay, they work they work really good now. We've modernized them; they're much better, um, and they don't release these gases that destroy the ozone layer. Okay, so any questions on laws of thermodynamics, heat pumps, or heat engines? Okay. Then I would like for you guys to answer these circled questions here about those things. So question two, three, four, seven, nine, and 10. All right, you got to do a bit of explaining in some of these. They're not just yes or no answers. Okay, so some good explaining, couple sentence answers kind of thing here. All right, I'll give you a little bit of time and then we'll go through them together. All right, so the first law of thermodynamics says what? How do we state that? It's also sometimes known as the law of what? Conservation of energy, right? Energy can't be created, it can't be destroyed. It can be transferred, it can be converted. Okay, that's the, that's the first law of thermodynamics. All right, what's the distinction between work and heat? Right? Right. So heat's a transfer of thermal energy. Work is a moving of material or matter from one place to another. That's a transfer of mechanical energy. So they're both transfers of energy. Heat transfers thermal. Work transfers mechanical. Okay, That's what we really have to remember. Work goes with mechanical. Heat goes with thermal. They're both transfers of energy, but they transfer different kinds. Okay, identify whether each of the following is best explained by the first or second law of thermodynamics. Okay, A, a bouncing ball eventually comes to rest on the floor. So what goes best with that? Energy flows from high energy to low energy or energy can't be created or destroyed. Second one, yeah, okay. the ball has lots of mechanical energy. Every time it hits the ground, it turns some of that mechanical energy into heat, sound, things like that, and those forms of energy flow outward into the environment, and it's always losing some energy, which is why eventually it just comes to rest on the floor. Okay. Uh, a metal spoon eventually becomes hot when placed in a pot of boiling water. Second law, yeah, because it's being transferred up the spoon, right? And so it's saying it's going from the boiling water to the spoon, it's going from high to low or hot to cold. Okay, and then obviously C, energy can't be created or destroyed, is law one. That's how we state law one. Okay, so question number seven, state the second law of thermodynamics. Energy flows from high to low, hot to cold, okay, whichever. Okay, that's the second law of thermodynamics. All right, number nine, water is observed to condense on the outside of a cold glass. Which way is the heat flowing? All right, so first off, when water condenses on the, on the glass, okay, what's happening? Like, what is condensation? Or where's that water coming from? Jeremy, where's that water coming from? Yeah, it's coming from the air, from water vapor in the air. So what's happening is the water vapor that's in the air has lots of energy because it's a vapor. Okay, For water to be a vapor, it has to have a lot of thermal energy. When it comes into contact with the cold glass, energy naturally flows from the hot water vapor to the cold glass. And as a result, the water vapor changes state from vapor to liquid and condenses on the glass, which means the energy is going from the vapor to the 
glass. The more condensation you get on the outside of a cold glass, the warmer that glass is going to get. Okay, because it's constantly going to be transferring energy from the surroundings, which are warmer, to the glass, which is colder. Okay, we're just seeing again the second law of thermodynamics in effect when we see that going on. Okay, question number 10. Which law of thermodynamics best describes the following statements? Explain your answer. You can't get something for nothing. First law or second law? First law, yeah. Okay, we can't create energy. Okay, that's getting something for nothing. So, um, you can't even get close. And I think what they mean here is you can't even get close to getting something for nothing. Still first law? Yeah. Okay. A rock will never suddenly jump into the air. Okay. Yeah, I think actually it could be either one. Second law, would say, I mean, where is it going to get the energy from? Okay. It can't go from low to, to high. And secondly, for a rock to jump into the air would involve us doing what? creating energy yeah okay so I, I think there's an argument to be made for either one on that one all right questions on any of those okay <clears throat> okay now I, did I put this part in your notes development of engine technology okay so I'm still going to go through it it's still a, kind of an important um, thing to talk about here in terms of how we develop technology even though we didn't have a full understanding of how it worked. Okay, not so much the technology, but how energy worked. Okay, um, so big thing for early scientists and engineers was making machines that could do the tasks that were hard for people to do or dangerous for people to do. Okay, uh, so they needed to make machines that could do those jobs better, right? The Archimedes screw, okay, is one of the, is one of these inventions. It's a pump, but it essentially uses a, a screw design to act as a well as a pump but also as an inclined plane to move a fluid okay it's easy to move something solid up a ramp okay or up an inclined plane but it's pretty hard to make water go up a hill okay just to go up a plane but if you have it moving circularly there's enough of that kind of polar nature of water going on that it'll you know stick enough to the to the inside of the screw and it'll eventually move it up okay and they found that if you turned it quickly you could make water water move up the screw okay uh, the Persian wheel is another one okay it's basically just wheels with pails on them okay and as the pails rotate okay you could make the water um, you could pick the water up from the river or lake and it would drop into this um, catch and then would go down like a, an aquifer, like a canal or something like that. Okay, and so that's how the Persian wheel could act also as a pump. Um, so a couple of kind of simple inventions here. So the first machine to use a hidden source of energy was Hero's steam engine. Okay, steam engines were kind of the first engines to come about. Now, steam engine uses the fact that water takes up more space as a vapor than it does as a liquid. And if you have it in a sealed container, like a piston, okay, uh, or sorry, with a piston, so in a cylinder, but with a piston in it, when it expands as, as a gas, what does it do to the piston? Okay, so a cylinder looks like this. Okay, any engine, internal combustion or steam engine, okay, we've got the cylinder like so, and then inside of it is a piston that's sealed essentially airtight, and then that piston is attached by a, a rod down to a crank. So if I put a gas in here and it expands, it will push on this piston and move it downwards, which will turn the crank. Okay, that's how basically all engines work. Okay, is that we use expanding gases to push on a piston, which then turns a crank, which then does whatever it's attached to, turns whatever it's attached to. Everyone kind of follow me on that? Okay, so Hero's steam engine uh, used this idea. They put water inside the cylinder, they heated it up, boiled it, okay, made it turn into steam, and when it did, it expanded and it pushed the piston down. And that was it. Then to make the whole thing reset, they had to dump cold water on it so it would cool and the piston would move back up. All right, it wasn't very good, it wasn't very effective. Okay, it didn't cycle on its own, it didn't expel the gases or anything like that. But it was early, it was an early design of it. Okay. Um, so yeah, it just, it wasn't like super effective, but it, it sort of worked, okay? Um, so this is kind of 
it was something like this. This is sort of like, this is the one uh, developed by Papin, but it's similar to, to Heroes. So everything, the combustion took place outside, the water was inside, it pushed, pushed upwards and then uh, moved whatever it was attached to. But in order to cool it off and make it work again, you had to throw water on it. So it wasn't something that, it was more a theoretical design. It was never actually used in factories or anything like that. It was just kind of a proof of concept, kind of an idea. Okay. Um, now, another thing that was used was something called the gunpowder engine. Okay. The gunpowder engine was, again, a theoretical kind of construct as opposed to something that was ever really designed in mass. Um, sealed container like this, put gunpowder inside, blow it up. Okay. When you blow up gunpowder, it makes a lot of expanding gases, yes? Okay. Pushes the piston upwards. All right, then you know you can cycle it back down, and blow it up again. Problem with this: um, you're blowing stuff up all the time. Okay, it's uncontrolled. Eventually, the cylinder will fail. People will get hurt. Okay, it wasn't obviously a very safe design, but the idea was there. Expanding gases can be harnessed and made to do work. Okay, um, okay so it's a couple other different uh, types of steam engines here. So we had uh, you know water coming in. Uh, when we separated the steam and the boiler, that helped to make them a little bit more efficient. Okay, we could make the pistons work a bit better. Okay, so that would have been like Savory's engine. Okay, first successful steam-powered pump, and it used it was used to pump water out of mines. The pump could lift water only six meters, so it wasn't much of an improvement over animals turning a wheel. Okay, um, but you didn't have to feed it. You didn't have to feed it food. Um, so to lift higher distances, the steam would have to be under higher pressure, and they couldn't build the boilers well enough that they would take the pressure okay they could only build them so they could withstand so much pressure and if they tried to make it go hotter than that or higher than that it would blow the seals and then people would get hurt because you got raging hot steam blasting out of these holes okay and scalding people so um they couldn't really build it much better okay um we got uh, the new common engine here okay it had kind of a pivoting thing the piston could go up and down okay it was easy to build it was easy to maintain could pump water much better okay but the cycle of heating and cooling the cylinder was very inefficient and required tremendous amounts of heat to function so basically you had to have a separate building for it to be in it couldn't be in the same building as the people that were working because it would just make the conditions unbearable okay um all right, so cold water, again, this was another one where the cold water had to be sprayed on the outside of the cylinder so it didn't cycle on its own, okay? Making a repeating or a cycling engine was really kind of the next the next thing, and that was Watt, okay, that uh, came up with that. So the Watt engine, okay, is made by James Watt. He's, he's pretty important because we named the units for power after him, okay? Watts, okay, it's named after him. Um, so he realized that there was tremendous waste of heat when water was heated and cooled in the same cylinder. So Watt designed this more efficient steam engine that had a separate condenser to cool the steam after it had moved the piston. So he had to institute essentially a series of valves, right? So water would come in, okay, uh, or steam would come in super hot, move the cylinder, and then those valves would be closed and the exhaust valves would be opened. The steam would be allowed to escape out the exhaust valves and then naturally the piston would move back up. Okay, close those exhaust valves, open the inlet valves, hot steam comes pouring in, pushes the piston back down, and we had suddenly this cycling effect that allowed the engine to not have to be cooled all the time, or the actual cylinder part to be cooled. We could cool the steam in another place and send it back to the boiler. Okay. Um, so it reduced the amount of heat involved, okay, and uh, obviously was, you know, worked a lot more efficiently. Okay, so looking at like the timeline here, okay, those are all kind of like late 1700s. And then we started developing what we called internal combustion engines, because all these steam engines that were designed by these people were external combustion. That is, the coal fire that heated the water was outside, okay? The boiler sat on top of the fire and the fire was underneath it, okay? So it wasn't all contained. So do you lose a lot of heat that way? Right? So you're heating this entire volume of air instead of just the thing you want to have get hot. So the advantage of an internal combustion engine is that the all of the heat is contained within the cylinder and would be much more efficient. The problem is, obviously, you can't put water and fire in the same place. Right? That's not going to work. So this internal combustion engine couldn't be a steam engine. Right? 
that. So it required essentially the development of different kinds of fuel. So people tried all kinds of stuff, okay? They tried uh, gas that had been kind of roughly refined from tar and oil. They tried coal gas. They tried all kinds of kerosene, stuff like that, okay? Um, it wasn't until uh, we were able to make um, essentially like coal gas and things like that, that we were able to make a really good four stroke internal combustion engine, which I'll show you how that works here in just a second. Okay. So in the internal combustion engine, okay, uh, we have the explosion or the burning taking place in the cylinder. So internal, not external. Now, um, when that happens, there's an explosion. Okay? Every time one of your spark plugs in your car ignites fuel, there's a small explosion. And that small explosion pushes the piston down and generates power. Okay? That can happen thousands of times every minute. Okay? If your car is just sitting and idling, Okay, so it's just sitting in the parking lot, it's in park, okay, uh, and it's just idling. It's looking at doing that probably somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 650 times per minute. Okay, so five to 650 explosions per minute okay, in there as it rotates. Okay, so we had the internal combustion engine and energy was released by burning fuel ignited by an electric spark. Okay, so we have an electric spark, okay, that causes this thing to work. So the ignition method used in modern engines is through spark plugs. Okay, uh, so this is how an internal combustion engine works. Okay, there are four strokes. That's why it's called a four-stroke engine, all right? There's the intake stroke, all right? So we've got the piston moving downwards during the intake uh, stroke. So the intake valve is open, okay, and the piston is moving down, creating a vacuum, that sucks the air fuel mixture into the cylinder. Okay, now this air fuel mixture in a modern car is determined by the car's computer, the throttle body, and the fuel injectors. Okay, all of that stuff just mixes air and fuel together in the proper ratio, okay, and it goes into the cylinder. All right, once the, the piston has gotten all the way down, then it starts the compression stroke. Okay, and that is that the, pi the piston starts to move back upwards. Okay. The intake valve and the exhaust valve during this stroke are both closed. That allows us to pressurize the fuel. Okay. If we put that air fuel mixture under pressure, it ignites much hotter. All right. So the cylinder moves up to this point here. Okay. And that's okay. when it gets to the top is when the spark plug ignites. Okay. So the spark plug will spark, the fuel will be detonated, and the rapid expansion of gases will cause the power stroke. Okay, and the power stroke is where those expanding gases force the cylinder downwards. Okay, so they force the cylinder downwards. That's where all the work is done. Okay, the last stroke is the exhaust stroke. So during the exhaust stroke, okay, the cylinder is moving back up. The intake valve is closed, but the exhaust valve is open, and all the spent gases, carbon dioxide, and whatever else, are pushed out into your exhaust system. So out the tailpipe. Okay, everybody kind of with me there. So there's four strokes, only one of which actually generates any power. Okay? The other three are designed to get it there and get rid of the exhaust, okay? which is why typically for a four-stroke engine, okay, um, you either have to have something that revs very high or you have to have other cylinders that are helping to make up the difference. Okay? But it has to kind of run on its own devices for the other three strokes because only one stroke actually generates any power. Okay? Everybody with me there? Okay, so all kinds, I mean, this is pretty simplified. All kinds of things can help to make this better, all right? Um, you have to have your engine timed correctly, okay? Timing means that you actually ignite the fuel when the piston is at the top of the cylinder. Okay? If it ignites early or late, then the fuel is not properly compressed and uh, the car um, is gonna feel underpowered and lagging. And you may even hear a like a pinging sound or a knocking sound um, from your engine because the, piston is actually already moving down before the fuel is ignited, or it's on its way up when the fuel is ignited, and it pushes it down early, and it makes weird noises, and it doesn't run quite right, and it runs very inefficiently. Okay? Um, other things that we can do is uh, we can change the amount of air and fuel. Now, most of the time, your car does that on its own. Okay? The computer makes decisions about temperature and air pressure and oxygen and all that kind of stuff and mixes the, the air and fuel correctly. Okay? All, like I say, all of that in a modern car is done by computer. In an old car that had a carburetor, you could adjust that all yourself, and you had to, and it was a pain in the neck. Okay? Um, so modern cars kind of do that for us. Okay? The other thing is different kinds of fuel. 
Okay, if you're running, um, you know, most cars will take just regular fuel, okay, 87 octane gasoline, right? Some cars will take 89 or even 91 octane. That would be the premium fuel, okay? If they take premium fuel, it's because they need higher compression. That is that they are going to compress the gas and fuel more and generate a hotter spark. So they need a hotter fuel. Okay? If you put the wrong kind of gas in a car that's supposed to run on premium, it won't run right and it can actually wreck it. Okay? Similarly, if your car is not supposed to run on premium, you shouldn't put premium in it. It'll make it run too hot. It's also not good for it. Okay? So you're always supposed to use whatever your car says to use in its manual. Okay? But different types of fuel can obviously generate more power. Okay? Like, really hot racing cars, they run on like hot, super high octane fuels, like 98, 105 octane, okay, that you can't even buy okay, at a gas station. Okay? They run on special types of fuel. Okay, so it's how the internal combustion engine works. I mean, I'm not saying that this is now gonna, you know, oh, my car's not working, I can go and fix it now because Coderre taught me how an internal combustion engine. No, okay, no, that's not the case. Okay. All right, so almost every engine in the early 1900s was one of these auto engines okay and it produced the same amount of power as one horse or one horsepower okay which made good sense because what was it designed to replace horses yeah when people went to the you know to, to buy a car or to buy a tractor or something like that their first question in that day and age was how many horses will this replace they had to know all their stuff was drawn by horses okay will this tractor replace two horses because, you know, my plow takes four horses, so I need a four horse power machine okay, in order to do this. All right, so they would have to go and, and find that kind of stuff out. All right, most important innovation okay, in the internal combustion engine came in the 1800s by Gottlieb Daimler. Okay, this guy here is actually one of the founding fathers of um, Chrysler. Chrysler, Daimler, Daimler, Chrysler, okay, uh, designed the petroleum-fueled internal combustion engine that used gasoline instead of coal gas, okay? Coal gas was um, inconsistent, so its quality was very inconsistent, uh, and it was hard to refine, and it turned into a vapor very easily, which could make it volatile and dangerous. Uh, petroleum gasoline stays in a liquid form much better, okay? So it was much safer to use. Uh, but it also burns hotter than coal gas, okay? And the engine was small enough that it could power road vehicles. That was kind of the big thing was you could never have a, a steam engine in a car. They're too big because you have to have an area where the combustion happens and then the area where the pistons are it just took up too much room. An internal combustion engine was miniaturized, okay? And able to be put into a car, okay? All right, so future technologies, okay, we still got to obey the, the laws of thermodynamics, okay? It doesn't matter how high tech we get, okay? Whatever we do is still going to be governed by this idea that energy flows from hot to cold or from high to low or whatever, okay? So we have to keep that in mind um, when we're developing basically anything. All right, questions on any of that? All right, I'm going to give you here a quick break, and then I'm going to talk quickly about... Um, some of the measurement stuff that we're going to be doing after the Easter break. So I'll give you four minutes here.